Throughout the history of the American Civil War, very few people command the same level of dread and mystery as William T. Anderson, also known as Bloody Bill. William Anderson was notorious for his brutal and mindless form of guerrilla warfare at the height of the Civil War. Together with his band of fighters known as the Missouri Bushwhackers, William Anderson unleashed a large scale of unprecedented terror on Union soldiers and sympathizers. His infamy was the stuff of legend, and his life story makes for interesting study. We'll explore the intriguing story of William Anderson's Bloody Bill in today's video. Before we proceed, please like and share this video. Also, subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications for our channel as well. Thanks, and let's head into the video. William T. Anderson, better known as Bloody Bill, was born between 1837 and 1839 in Hopkins County, Kentucky. He was the eldest of seven children born to William C. and Martha Anderson. Right from his childhood, William Anderson had already started to show criminal tendencies. With the onset of the Civil War in 1860, the demand for horses was at an all-time high. The young Anderson saw this as an opportunity to make a profit, and so he joined forces with his brother to steal horses along the Santa Fe Trail to be sold later. At one point, Anderson even got to work as an assistant for a wagon trail that moved cargo to New Mexico. There, he also saw a chance to continue in his thievery. So when, on one of their trips to New Mexico, the wagon, the horses, and all its cargo disappeared, Fingers were pointed, and Anderson was at the center of it. Anderson and his brothers continued living this lifestyle throughout their childhood, and they soon added violence to their list of crimes. They frequently got into shootouts with Native Americans in Kansas, and these clashes foreshadow the brutal path that lay ahead for the young Anderson. His brother Ellis is reported to have killed a Native Indian after an argument over a bottle of whiskey while working on a ranch with his brother. While the young Anderson and his family undoubtedly lived a rough life, there was even more tragedy lying in store for them. In June 1860, a tragic accident occurred when Bill's mother Martha was struck and killed by lightning. Around the same time, one of Bill's brothers was allegedly killed by a Native American. These traumatic events would shape the young Anderson's life and undoubtedly contribute to his future path of violence and retribution. The loss of his mother and brother at such a young age likely instilled a deep-seated anger and resentment within Bill Anderson. These events fueled his later actions and unwavering pursuit of vengeance. The emotional scars from these early tragedies may have hardened his heart and solidified his resolve to fight, no matter the cost. In late 1861, Bill Anderson became friends with Judge Baker, and the duo were involved in several criminal escapades together. They also attempted to join the Confederate Army. Unfortunately, they were captured by the 6th Kansas Cavalry in Vernon County, Missouri. Before that, Baker had been involved in a relationship with Ellen Anderson, William's sister. He would later ditch her for another woman after the death of his previous wife. This turn of events may have caused a rift in the relationship between Baker and the Anderson family. So, after Baker's capture in Missouri, he further distanced himself from the Anderson family. At a time, Baker even issued a warrant for the arrest of Bill's brother, Griffith. When Bill's father asked to have the warrant suspended, a quarrel ensued, resulting in Baker shooting and killing the Anderson patriarch. The murder of his father at the hands of a Union sympathizer was one event that solidified Bill Anderson's allegiance to the Confederate cause. Bill Anderson was rightfully enraged by this profound loss and so he exacted revenge on July 2, 1862, by killing Baker and burning down his house. 
Some accounts suggest that Anderson shot Baker and then set the house ablaze, while others claim that Baker took his own life after realizing he was trapped in the burning building. Regardless of the exact details, the act of killing Baker and destroying his home marked a point of no return for Anderson. He had crossed a line, committing a brutal act of vengeance that would set him on a path of increasingly violent and ruthless behavior. From that moment on, Anderson became a wanted man, forced to flee to Missouri and embrace a life of guerrilla warfare. During the Civil War, Anderson's sisters and other women were rounded up by Union General Thomas Ewing Jr. and imprisoned as suspected Confederate spies. In a devastating incident, the makeshift jail in Kansas City collapsed, killing Anderson's 14-year-old sister. His 10-year-old sister, Martha, had her legs crushed, leaving her crippled for life, while his 16-year-old sister, Molly, suffered severe back injuries and facial lacerations. The collapse of the prison, which some believe was intentional, dealt a crushing blow to the Anderson family. Not only did they lose a young girl, but two more sisters were left permanently disfigured and disabled, carrying the physical and emotional scars of the tragedy for the rest of their lives. This horrific event, coupled with the earlier loss of his mother and brother, likely pushed Anderson over the edge. The suffering inflicted upon his innocent sisters, who were mere pawns in the conflict, must have filled him with an all-consuming rage and a thirst for vengeance against the Union forces responsible. It's been suggested that the collapse and the subsequent trauma endured by his sisters was a turning point for Anderson. From that moment on, he became consumed by a desire for retribution, fueling his already burning hatred for the Union and solidifying his determination to seek justice, no matter how brutal or extreme his actions might become. Driven by the loss and suffering inflicted upon his family, Anderson joined the infamous Quantrell's Raiders. The Quantrill Raiders were a notorious group of guerrilla soldiers whose stock in trade was the launching of attacks on civilians along the Missouri-Kansas border. They were a group of Confederate guerrilla soldiers better known as bushwhackers, and their actions brought terror to people traveling this route. Among the Raiders were notable figures such as Archie Clement, Frank and Jesse James, Cole Younger, and even a few African-American members, including James Nolan, one of Quantrell's most trusted scouts. A combination of factors likely fueled Anderson's decision to join Quantrill's Raiders. One of these factors was his burning desire for revenge against the Union, his need for a sense of belonging and camaraderie after losing so many loved ones, and his natural affinity for the guerrilla tactics employed by the Bushwhackers. While working with the Quantrill Raiders, Anderson had a couple of run-ins with the group's hierarchy on account of their actions. Anderson and his brother carried out attacks against Union forces, as well as against people on the Confederate side. This provoked some of the group's leaders, including William Quantrill, who was one of the guerrilla group's chieftains. William Quantrill cautioned Anderson and warned him that any further attacks against Confederate forces would lead to their removal from the group's ranks. Although the Raiders were not officially affiliated with the Confederate Army, they fought fiercely for the Southern cause. They employed unconventional and often brutal methods to strike fear into the hearts of their enemies. With Anderson having already experienced profound personal loss and tragedy in his lifetime, he likely found a sense of purpose and kinship among these men who shared his passion for the Confederacy. One other thing that endeared him to this cause was that the group shared his willingness to engage in violent acts of retaliation, and this inspired his future actions. Sometime in 1863, Anderson suffered a personal tragedy that would push him further into a life of terror. Some men from the Union captured a few women who they suspected of supplying the Confederate guerrilla fighters with food, 
clothing and information. Among the women captured were Anderson's three sisters, Mary, Martha, and Josephine. They were taken to an old building that served as a prison where they would be held in the meantime. Unfortunately, the building collapsed on the 11th of August, and among the casualties was one of Anderson's sisters, Josephine. His other sisters escaped with varying degrees of injuries, but this incident left a lasting scar in the mind of the eldest Anderson, and his hatred for the Union forces swelled even further. He bid his time, waiting for the perfect opportunity to exact vengeance on the Union forces. That opportunity would soon present itself 10 days later, on August 21, 1863. Quantrell's raiders, including Anderson, carried out a devastating raid on the town of Lawrence, Kansas. The attack, known as the Lawrence Massacre, was a retaliatory strike for the prison collapse and the sacking of the pro-Confederate town of Osceola by Jayhawkers, led by James Lane. Approximately 400 guerrillas rode into Lawrence at dawn, killing between 160 and 190 men and boys. They ransacked homes, shot civilians, looted stores, and set fire to buildings. The havoc they wreaked during the onslaught was later estimated at between $1 million and $411 million in damage in 1863 dollars. The massacre left 85 widows and decimated nearly 20% of the town's male population. The scale of destruction committed was so massive and news spread fast about it across the front lines. The Lawrence Massacre was a defining moment in the border conflict and a testament to the brutality and uncompromising nature of Quantrell's raiders, including Anderson. While the exact details of Anderson's role in the massacre are unclear, his involvement in such a devastating and bloody attack undoubtedly contributed to his growing reputation as a relentless and ruthless guerrilla fighter. The sheer scale of the destruction and loss of life in Lawrence was unprecedented, even in the context of the Civil War. The raiders showed no iota of mercy, slaughtering men and boys indiscriminately while reportedly sparing women and girls. This selective brutality only added to the air of terror and infamy that surrounded the Bushwhackers and their leader, Quantrell. In the aftermath of the Lawrence Massacre, Union General Ewing issued General Order No. 11. This order forced rural residents in the affected area to either prove their loyalty to the Union or vacate their homes and farms. This draconian measure was intended to cut off support for the Bushwhackers, but it ultimately backfired. It only served to garner greater sympathy and aid for the guerrilla fighters among the displaced civilians. With the dust settling after the Lawrence Massacre, Anderson had other plans in store. He was further encouraged by this latest successful outing and started making moves to gain even further grounds along the front lines. Soon, he was increasingly launching his attacks with some of the raiders to the growing dismay of the group's leaders. To make matters worse, Anderson continued to attack people on the Confederate side, as well as those on the Union side, leading him to clash with William Quantrill. After a falling out with Quantrill, Anderson formed his band of raiders, which included Jesse and Frank James, David Poole, and Archie Clements. One fateful day on September 1864, Anderson and some of the men had a few too many drinks and went into town, where they went on to cause a great deal of havoc. They left a trail of robberies and lootings in their drunken rage, but it didn't end there. Anderson and around 80 of his men descended upon the town of Centralia and seized control of a coach. They were wearing stolen Union Army uniforms and it was easy for them to gain access to the coach. While on board the train, they stumbled on a group of Union soldiers numbering between 20 and 30. After they robbed other civilians in the coach of their possessions, they proceeded to separate 
and line up the Union soldiers. One by one, Anderson and his team summarily executed the unarmed Union soldiers who were on leave, sparing only one prisoner, Sergeant Thomas Goodman. The Centralia Massacre was a calculated and ruthless act of retaliation that was carried out with a level of brutality that would become synonymous with Anderson's name. By donning Union uniforms, Anderson's men lured their victims into a false sense of security before unleashing their deadly ambush. The execution of the 23 unarmed soldiers, many of whom were on leave after the grueling Battle of Atlanta, was a chilling display of Anderson's disregard for the rules of warfare and his willingness to target and kill those who posed no immediate threat. This cold-blooded act solidified his reputation for uncompromising brutality and earned him the moniker Bloody Bill. Yet, Anderson was not finished. Some sources have it that, even after supervising the murder of the Union soldiers in their ill-fated stagecoach journey, Anderson and his troops committed another equally brutal act later that day. This time, it was the turn of Major A.V.E. Johnston and his 39th Missouri Infantry to feel the brute wrath of Anderson and his bloodthirsty troops. After sighting Johnson's troops from afar, Anderson and his over 300-man troop pursued after him and cornered him into an open field. Armed on their horsebacks with loaded revolvers, Anderson's men outnumbered that of Johnson and pinned them against dense foliage on two sides and a deep canal on another. With nowhere to turn to while facing superior firepower, Major Johnson succumbed to Anderson's men. His men were reported to have been scalped and mutilated in one of the many brutal acts of terror that Anderson later picked up. The events of that day brought great anger to the camp of the Union forces, and an organized search was commissioned to track down Anderson. Anderson's name had become synonymous with terror and violence, and he had added scalping and mutilation to his list of grievous ills. His actions were widely condemned even by some within the Confederate ranks as crossing a line of decency and honor. But to Anderson and his men, these acts were simply a means to an end, a way to strike fear into the hearts of their enemies and further the cause of the Confederacy. While Anderson's notoriety grew immensely and his terror spread across Union lines, the charge to eliminate him had intensified. The increasing number of losses the Union had suffered at the hands of Anderson and the Quantrill Raiders had caused serious concern, and they quickly devised a plan to stop him. On October 26, 1864, a special gang unit led by Colonel Samuel P. Cox was assembled to track down Anderson and his men. In a final confrontation, Anderson's camp of 150 men was lured into an ambush by Union troops using their guerrilla tactics against them. Anderson led a desperate charge, which many historians consider a suicide mission. He and one other man, James Raines, managed to breach the Union line, but Anderson was shot in the head and killed instantly. His body was adorned with Union scalps, personal effects, and a silk cord with 53 knots, each representing a man he had killed with his own hands. The death of William Anderson, also known as Bloody Bill, marked the end of a life of brutality and great terror. For most of his life, Anderson led several violent charges against perceived enemies, mostly on the side of the Union. He started from a life of petty crime, including theft of horses and cargo, and descended into a life of brutal guerrilla warfare. After his death, Anderson's body was displayed in Richmond, Missouri, where a local dentist and photographer captured images of his corpse, minus a finger that had been cut off to steal his wedding ring. His decapitated head was placed on a telegraph pole, and the rest of his body was dragged through the streets before being buried in a shallow grave.
Colonel Samuel Cox was regarded as a hero for taking out the Union side's number one enemy that had perpetrated such a great deal of terror on their side. Anderson's death became a motivating factor for Jesse James, who carried out the 1869 bank robbery in Gallatin, Missouri, mistakenly shooting someone he believed to be Colonel Cox. The notorious outlaw's actions were fueled by a desire for revenge against the man responsible for killing his mentor, Bloody Bill Anderson. Anderson's life and actions have been heavily mythologized, with some portraying him as a sadistic murderer and others as a dashing Confederate cavalier. Regardless of the perspectives, his legacy remains a controversial and complex chapter in the history of the Civil War and the notorious figures that emerged from the conflict. The gruesome desecration of Anderson's body after his death, with his corpse being mutilated, displayed, and buried in a shallow grave, speaks volumes about the intense hatred and fear he had inspired among his Union adversaries. To them, he was the embodiment of the brutal Confederate guerrilla fighter, a man who showed no mercy and left a trail of bloodshed in his wake. Yet, to his fellow bushwhackers and sympathizers of the Southern cause, Anderson was a hero. A fearless warrior who fought with unwavering dedication and a willingness to employ any means necessary to defend the Confederacy. His legends became intertwined with those of other notorious figures like Jesse James, further cementing his place in the annals of American folklore.